right. Well, <clears throat> we are going to bring the uh, the series on evangelism training in for a landing. I, I was telling Rick the other day that I made I made a list back when I started. The, well, when I was preparing for this in December, made a list of all the tools and techniques that I could think of. Um, and we we're about 40% of the way through that list. But I told him, I feel like at this point, we've covered some of the, uh, some of the ones I think we're most likely to use. And I think if we just continue going through the list, I'm gonna repeat myself a lot and y'all are gonna be sick of evangelism. You may not wanna go do it after that. So we're gonna, we're gonna wind this down. This will be my last presentation, at least in this series. Not to say that we'll never do evangelism training again. Um, and certainly not saying that we'll never talk about sharing our faith again. But this will be my last presentation in this series. And then Brother Rick and I had talked about a, uh, a technique a while back that I had asked him to, to share something on. So he'll do that next week, and then we will move on to something else. Now this, some of you may have heard of the Way of the Master or the Good Person Test. And uh, this is something that I have used since I was exposed to it about 10 years ago. Although when I went looking for materials this week, I realized apparently I have not used their whole training and their whole technique. I picked up about 10 years ago on a part of it and ran with that, which is kind of what, what I've told you all along I've done with various evangelism techniques. I've taken training and then taken little bits and pieces and and glued it together in, in kind of a collage of evangelism techniques. So I've used part of this. I, I can't walk you through the whole way of the master uh, training. Uh, if you're thinking, okay, I'm, I've heard that term, but I can't place it. Uh, Ray Comfort and Kirk Cameron, the, the actor Kirk Cameron, this is kind of what they have become famous uh, for leading as a, as a ministry and as an evangelism technique, and they've done television specials, they do videos all the time of them sharing the gospel with people this way. What it turns out I've been using is not the entire way of the master training, but it's been really just the beginning of what they use and been, have been using that as an opportunity, as a, as a springboard to be able to, to talk to people about the gospel. So if you're ever, if, if you've been in a position where you've thought, I'd love to share my faith, but I really don't know how to get started, that tends to be the hardest Part, it feels like a lot of times the hardest part is how, how do I get started doing this how do I how do I start the conversation how do I take the conversation and make that initial start from where we are into the gospel this is one way to do it um, and depending on how you use it it can be it can be effective um, so I'm gonna I, I'm gonna walk you through this understand it's not the entire way of the master presentation it's what I thought was, but it's just, it's just part of it. But it, it works for, for what I need it for. And uh, I've also heard it called the good person test. And you can, you can simply start by asking somebody, do you consider yourself to be a good person? Now, most of us are going to say what? Yes. yes. I heard somebody on the radio this week even uh, say, even evil people think that they're doing good. <laughs> And I had to stop and think about that. There's some evil people in, in history. There's some evil people in the world. They thought they were doing something good. They were dead wrong, but they thought they were doing something good. Um, Hitler, absolutely evil, but in his twisted mind, he had convinced himself that he was doing something for the good of Germany. Uh, you could say the same thing about Stalin, about Mao, about Pol Pot. You could say the same about the lunatic who shot a bunch of people in Atlanta last, uh, last week or earlier this week. In, in their twisted thinking, they think they're doing good. So we, we tend to think of ourselves as good people. And, and walking up to somebody on the street, they would, are you a good person? Well, I haven't, you know, I, I haven't murdered anybody. I haven't done like the nut in Atlanta. I haven't. You know, I'm not as bad as Hitler, so I'm a good person. I don't, I don't cheat on my wife. I don't cheat on my taxes. You know, I'm basically a, a good person. But that's not what the Bible teaches. And so we, in this approach, you point somebody to the Ten Commandments. Because we know that there are all sorts, I mean, the, the Bible is filled with rules. 
we, we don't emphasize the Bible as a rule book because that's not really what it's about. It's about us being reconciled to God. But the truth is there are rules in the Bible. There are, there are rules and laws in the, in the Old Testament, in the New Testament. And instead of saying, you know, all of these, it can be a little cumbersome to try to walk somebody through all of those. We can say, what about the Ten Commandments? Because out of all the, the rules in God's Word, that's going to be what people are most familiar with, at least in part. And say, what if we were, if God were to judge us by the Ten Commandments? And most people would say, yeah, even by the Ten Commandments, I'm pretty good. Now, what are the Ten Commandments? Number one, you shall make no other, uh, you shall have no other gods before me, no idolatry. Number two, you shall not make for yourself a carved image. And I, I shortened these a little bit because some of them go on for two or three verses. That's the, the gist of it, though. Don't make statues and bow down to them. Number three, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Number four, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Number five, honor your father and your mother. Number six, you shall not murder. Number seven, you shall not commit adultery. Number seven, I'm sorry, number eight, you shall not steal. Number nine, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. And number 10, you shall not covet. I know you've all seen this before because we have a gigantic stone monument out, <laughs> out in front of the building. So anytime you've driven in here, you've seen this. But the Ten Commandments, even if, if we were to say, if God were to judge you by the Ten Commandments, how do you think you'd do? And, and probably, especially as somebody who doesn't know where this is going, doesn't uh, necessarily understand the gospel, we think, well, you know, I, I've done pretty well. You know, I haven't killed anybody. I haven't committed adultery. You know, I haven't done... We think I've done pretty well. You can zero in on just four of these. Now, you could take any one or two of these. But these are some that, that Jesus deals with. These are some that I, I think we either misunderstand or Jesus clarifies in the New Testament that help us understand we're really not as good as we think we are. And that's what needs to be understood because we tend to, mankind, we tend to think we're good. We tend to judge ourselves by our, well, by what we'd like to think we are as opposed to what we really are. And that has been part of the confusion about the gospel is people think, well, yeah, Jesus died to save sinners, but I'm a good person. Or they think God is unjust because they think, why would, why would a loving God send people to hell over just a few sins? Because they think we're basically good and we just, you know, a little bit of sin here and there. They don't realize the Bible teaches we're basically evil. Not to say that we're as evil as we could be. If you're sitting there thinking, but I'm basically a nice person. I think all of us in here are basically nice people, but our hearts by nature are in rebellion against God. And the law demonstrates that. Just look at commandments six through nine. I have to stop and check the Roman numerals here and make sure I'm telling you the right number. Commandments six through nine. Let's look at just these four. You shall not murder. Now, most people that you encounter are going to say, well, no, I have, I've never killed anybody. I mean, that's what people say a lot of times, even before you ask about that commandment. Are you a good person? Well, I've never murdered anybody. I'm basically a good person. So have you ever committed murder? Be careful who you ask this of. You might, <laughs> you might hear answers you don't want to hear. You might get called to testify at some point. Most people, the overwhelming majority of people are going to say, no, I've never committed murder. By that test, yes, I'm basically a good person. But we can ask, have you ever been unjustly angry with someone? Have you ever been angry with somebody that you had no right to be angry with? Have you ever been angrier than you should have under the circumstances? Have you ever been angry with somebody in, in any way that was excessive, where that rage just kind of wells up inside you? Because I can tell you, I have. I have. Here's what Jesus said about it in Matthew 5, 21 and 22. By the way, most, uh, most, if not all, of our text is going to come from Matthew chapter 5 tonight if you, if you want to turn there and follow along with me. Matthew 5, 21 and 22, Jesus said, You have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not murder, and whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. But I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. 
And he, he talks to, after that, a little bit about the things that come out of our mouths as a result of that anger. Jesus, we're going to look at a couple things that Jesus said at this time, but what he's doing is he's talking to the Pharisees, or, or talking with the Pharisees nearby as he's delivering the Sermon on the Mount. And I think he used this, the Pharisees as an object lesson all throughout the Sermon on the Mount because their deal was, you know what, as long as we do the right things outwardly, as long as we keep our behavior under control, as long as we check all the right boxes, then we're going to be right with God. We're, we are good people. And Jesus pointed to them and said, you say you're a good person because you've never committed murder, and yet there is murder lurking in your heart, is the point that Jesus was trying to make to them. So what Jesus did was he taught that this kind of anger, this, this excessive anger, this irrational anger, this, uh, th this anger without a reason, that, that drives us just to be enraged with somebody else. He said that kind of anger and murder are both expressions of the same kind of sinful condition within the heart. So we would look at it as humans and say, well, getting angry with somebody, that's nowhere near as bad as murder. Now, let's be clear. Each, uh, there are different degrees of impact from, from different sins and there are different consequences involved in different sins. Uh, people have said every sin is the same. That's true in one sense. It's not true in another. There, even in Scripture, there are different consequences to certain sins. But the fact is, when it comes to condemning us before God, sin is sin. And it doesn't matter if I only ever committed one little sin, what we would call a little sin, or one big sin, or a ton of big sins, if the standard of, if God's standard is absolute sinless perfection, even one little sin is enough to fall short of that. And if I miss it by an inch, I might as well have missed it by a mile, because God's standard is unchanging. And so what he was revealing to the Pharisees is that this rage that they, they, they might have had, had themselves under control on the outside, but the rage that they experienced toward other people and the bitterness and the, the anger and the, the grudges that they held, they were, they were symptoms of the same root sin. And sometimes that, that sin expressed itself through anger. Sometimes that sin expressed itself through murder. But either way, it was a demonstration of a heart that was not right with God. Now, you may not have to go through that whole presentation about the background with the Pharisees and all that. With, with somebody that you're sharing the gospel with. But you need to make the point that Jesus makes here that even that unjust anger in the heart, and it's not always a sin to be angry. The Bible talks about being angry and sinning not. It's all about the, the rationale for it and, and what you do about it. But this kind of anger that he's talking about, if you've ever been angry with somebody unreasonably, unjustly, that Jesus says it's, it's related to murder. And no, you didn't go out and shoot somebody or stab somebody, but the condition of your heart was no different from somebody who did. You just held it together a little bit better on the outside. But the heart is still wrong. So according to Jesus' definition, have I ever committed murder? And I, I'm talking about me. Have I ever committed murder according to Jesus' definition? Yes, I have. And you might even go a step further and say, how many times have you done this? I can't count. So if I've committed murder, what does that make me? Sinner. Murderer. Murderer. Yes to the other thing too. Yes, sinner also. But it makes me a murderer. And by the way, as you talk to somebody about this, Again, I'm going to caution you, and I'll caution you a few more times before we're done. Be very careful about how you use this approach. You may not want to use this approach in every circumstance, because if it's done wrong, it can be very offensive. And the last thing you want to do also is, is tell somebody, well, you've murdered in your heart according to Jesus. That makes you a murderer. No, ask more questions than you give answers. Ask them, what would that make you by definition? Or even use yourself as the example and say, what does that make me by definition? Let them come to the conclusion that according to Jesus' definition, I'm a murderer. What does that mean about them as well? 
and then how many times have you done this? It, it just makes the point that we can't even say, well, it was just an isolated incident. Even if it was one time, that was enough. But if we're honest with ourselves, we do this all the time. Anytime I get behind the wheel, I start feeling this way. And I don't act it out. I don't act out on it. I don't, I don't uh, try to run people off the road like Brad was talking about. But in my heart, <laughs> in my heart, it's there. And sometimes in my mouth, it's there. So commandment number seven, you shall not commit adultery. And most people are going to be able to say, well, no, I've never done this. Have you ever committed adultery? No, I have never gone out and had an affair. It's never even crossed my mind. Number one, it's wrong. Number two, I've told my wife, it sounds like a lot of work. Okay, it, trying to keep story straight and all that. Yeah, that's supposed to be a joke. <laughs> but have you ever had lustful thoughts towards someone? And that's a different question altogether. Because the Pharisees would have said, I've never gone out and had an affair. But if they ever looked at somebody in a way that they weren't supposed to, and Jesus knew that they had, he said to them in, in Matthew 5, 27 and 28, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So what point is he making? He's making the same point that he was with the commandment about murder. He's saying, you say that you're righteous and you're right with God because you followed this law outwardly, but look at what's in your heart. And he said that that lustful thought may not have the same consequences here on earth as, as actually going out and having an affair, but they are both expressions of the same condition in the heart. He was teaching that both the thought and the action reveal the same thing about a heart that's in rebellion against God. And so then you, you could ask somebody, how many times have you done that? And an honest person is going to say, well, I can't really count. So what would that make us then? Adulterer. Okay. You shall not steal. Now, I try not to do this one. But you ask somebody, have you ever stolen? Again, kind of like with the murder one. Be careful who you ask this of because you don't want to be called, you don't want to be subpoenaed to testify in court. But have you ever stolen? Again, most people are going to say, I don't steal. Have you, you just, you don't even have to look to Jesus to clarify the explanation of this. You just have to, you just have to press a little harder. Have you ever taken anything that didn't belong to you, regardless of how much it cost or how much it was worth? Well, suddenly that standard, wow, that definition, that explanation is a little harder to, to live up to, right? Could be something as simple as I took somebody's pen. I took the pen from the bank. Mm -hmm. I've never gone into a store and stolen anything. And I'll tell you, there might have, been a, might have been a time or two when I knew that was my wife's cookie there on the, mm -hmm. on the counter. <laughs> Saturday, I, Saturday, I was taking a vacation from Weight Watchers. I knew that was Charlie's green iced donut with sprinkles on it. And I big fat ate it anyway. <laughs> I took it with me and I sat out there on my riding lawnmower and I had a donut party. Even though I paid for it, even though it came out of my account, I knew that was earmarked for Charlie. So I guess you could say I stole Charlie's donut. And it didn't bother me a bit. <laughs> I think if we're honest, we've all taken something that didn't belong to us. Now we think of, have you ever stolen? Well, I've never, I've never robbed somebody. I've never knocked over a bank. I've never committed identity theft. I've never snuck over and stolen my, my neighbor's um, bison sculpture from their yard, no matter how much I coveted it. I think there was a commandment up there about that too. I've never done any of that, but if we press a little harder, have you taken anything that wasn't yours? And just about everybody's going to have to be honest and say that they did. Okay, now how many times? we start to think about it, we realize that according to the law of God, if we steal, what are we? Thieves. I just knew somebody was going to say stealers. <laughs> <laughs> We've all stolen. That makes us thieves. You shall not bear false witness. Have you ever borne false witness? This specifically, this commandment specifically was talking about, the, I, I believe it was talking about the legal system in ancient Israel. 
It, sometimes we'll shorten it to thou shalt not lie. Now, the Bible is not in favor of lying, but this goes a step further because they didn't have forensics in that day. They needed to be able to trust eyewitnesses. And so you were not supposed to accuse somebody of doing, you were not supposed to testify against somebody falsely because it undermined the entire basis of their, their justice system. Don't lie about somebody else. So you've probably never gotten on the stand, and anybody you talk to has probably never gotten on the stand and testified against somebody falsely, but have you ever said anything about somebody that wasn't true? This commandment specifically about not lying about other people. Have you ever said anything about someone else that wasn't true? Guilty. And I'm not, I'm, I'm not saying something that... Uh, I just want to clarify for him because we don't lie in our house and we have discussions about that. There's a difference between so saying something that's not true that you think is true. That's a mistake. It's an error. That may be something stupid to say, but it's not a lie. But I'm talking about saying something about somebody that you know is not true. And I've done that. So what does that make me? A liar. A liar. Again, I don't make a, ha a habit of it. Ha don't make a habit of it, but it has happened, and it has happened more times than I would care to admit. So we ask these questions, and again, you can put it on yourself to do it in a non-threatening way, but encourage them to draw their own conclusions about themselves. But according to the law of God, just these four commandments that we've looked at, out of the Ten Commandments, and out of all the rules in God's Word, We've already established that according to God's definition, we are lying, thieving, murdering adulterers. I've got to go back and revisit that question about am I a good person? So if God were to judge you by the Ten Commandments, or even just those four, how many of us earn a perfect score? None of us. And that's hard to hear. I, I, I understand that. I don't, I don't like admitting these things, even though I, I know they're true. Uh-oh. Sorry, I just lost my... That's... Okay. I don't like, I don't like admitting it. I don't like telling it to you about yourselves. I don't like telling it to anybody else. But it's, it's, it's true. And we need to understand that because, as I said, there's, there is that misconception that we're, people are basically good. There is that misconception that maybe God is overreacting just a little bit. And I could see why people would think that if they think we are basically good and we just do a few bad things, that maybe God's overreacting. But when you realize that just the natural state of our hearts is to be in rebellion against God, and that God's standard is absolute perfection. And not only do we just miss it with a few bad acts, but we miss it by a long shot because of who we are and what is basically in our hearts. That's what people need to understand in order for them to understand what they, what they need as far as salvation. Because Jesus said in the passage right before what we've looked at, he said, Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets, I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Okay, he wanted to make sure they understood. He's, he's not changing the law. He's not overthrowing the law. He came because we could not keep the law. The law was really just there as a sign to show us how holy God is and how unholy we are. By definition, we could not keep the law. He came to fulfill the demands of the law. He came to do it for us. Okay? He said, For assuredly, I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. That doesn't mean that all the Old Testament law applies to us. That means that as God's standard of holiness, it has not changed. And we are just as dependent on him to fulfill the demands of the law for us now as they were then. Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Here's what I want you to focus in on. For I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. And so what he did, to this, did for this group of people was to point 
at the, the most outwardly righteous people in their society. He pointed at the religious elites, the ones who had God's law memorized, and as far as the way they behaved, as far as the way they carried themselves, how they lived, they looked like they were the most saintly, godly people there were. And he said, you've got to do better than that. And I think of some of the, the godliest people I've ever known. And not to put them on, on par with the Pharisees, because they're not that way at all. But I've got some pictures running through my mind, even of some people that, that have now gone on to be with Jesus. And these are some of the people that I, I look to as examples. And Jesus could just as easily say, if your righteousness does not exceed theirs, and we've got to come to the realization that if even these, the people that we think have it all together, if even they are not good enough, then we've got a real problem. And that is why Jesus came and died on the cross to pay for our sins so that we could be forgiven, so that we could have eternal life. Because you and I weren't ever going to be good enough to enter in on our own. And so this is not a whole gospel presentation. I'm sorry, I'm trying to... My slides are going haywire. This has never happened before. It's not a whole gospel presentation once I really stopped and thought about it. You'd need to walk through some of the other things that we've discussed over the last several weeks. But if you're dealing with somebody who just can't get past the idea, but I'm a good person, or I've just got to try harder... This may be the hammer you need to break that down. And I've told you, as I talk to people about, about Christ, where we seem to always get stuck is on works. Well, if I could just try harder. No, that, that's not it. I mean, it's good to want to do good things, but that's not going to get you into heaven. Get the relationship with God through Jesus Christ and then come back and do good things to, to please Him, but not to try to earn your way there. I don't know if it's our culture, I don't know if it's human nature, but people get so hung up on works and if I could just be a good person or I, I am a good person or I'm trying to be a good person. And we just need something sometimes to, to knock the bricks out of that wall. Not to make people feel bad about themselves, but to, under, to, to help people understand that they really do need Jesus. There is no other way. So this, is, this can be a very helpful tool. You don't have to go through all the explanations. I mean, I, I've given you more than what I would give somebody that I'm just talking to on the street. But you can go through, you know, do you consider yourself a good person? Pick one or two of the commandments. Say, do you know what Jesus said about that? Do you, do you live up to that standard? I don't. What does that make me? And, and go through that and explain the need for Christ. But it may be just the hammer you need to knock some blocks out of that wall so we can break through and help people understand the need for Jesus. This, this is not a, again, this is not a technique to walk up to somebody. You think you're a good person, don't you? Well, let me tell you why you're not. <laughs> if used incorrectly, out of all the techniques I've talked with you about, this one is the, the most likely, if used incorrectly, to get your teeth knocked out. You've got to be careful in how you approach it. We've got to be humble in our in, in our discussions with people. That's why I said, turn it back on yourself. When you're telling people how rotten you are and how Jesus saved you anyway, it's hard for them to get mad at you for something you're saying about yourself. I don't have a handout for you tonight. Your handout is Matthew chapter 5 and Exodus chapter 20. But tuck this away somewhere in the back of your mind. It may be something that comes in handy for you later on as you try to help somebody overcome that, that obstacle of our goodness and our works.